Lindsay, I'm an ambulatory care clinical pharmacy specialist at the anticoagulation clinic, along with Amber, actually. Um, and we work in the congestive heart failure clinic as well. Um, we are both one of those 81 CDTM pharmacists, so we run the anticoag clinic under a collaborative practice agreement. So today, I'm going to be talking about anticoagulation and thrombosis management with a spotlight really on the direct oral anticoagulants. Warfarin does sort of pop its head in in a couple of places that I think are important. But if we were going to talk about warfarin, it would be a much longer <laughs> CD. So we, we skipped over some of the warfarin stuff. I have no conflicts of interest as, really, you know, as it relates to this program. We'll use my objectives as kind of a road map of where we're going to go. We're going to talk about the nuance differences between the direct oral anticoagulants. Uh, then we will look at what we know from the pivotal trials. That'll be relatively brief. Those are all in comparison to warfarin. And then the exciting part for me, anyway, anticoagulant nerdy, is the claims data or the real world data studies that have recently been published or have been accepted for publication and will be published very soon. Uh, so that will then help us to choose an appropriate anticoagulant for a patient. After we get through all of that, we will talk a little bit about periprocedural management of the oral anticoagulants. This is one of the sections where warfarin does come in, um, and I do, you know, talk about bridge therapy and things with warfarin. And then we will wrap everything up with what we know about managing severe bleeding with patients on oral anticoagulants. And this is another section where warfarin um, we'll talk about. Since it's so well outlined, we'll talk about that as well as the direct oral anticoagulants. First, we'll talk lingo. When these agents first came to market uh, with Pradaxa or Dabigatran in 2010, we were calling them the NOAX, or the newer, new, or the novel anti-oral coagulants. However, um, they're not so new anymore, so to keep that NOAC terminology, people say the non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants. The problem with NOAC is that it's recently been, had a couple of incidents where people thought it was no anticoagulation. So uh, we have to kind of veer away from NOAC. You'll still hear it a lot. It's very popular. It really stuck. Uh, however, we should veer away from it because it could potentially lead to an error. Oral direct inhibitors or ODIs, that in the beginning came up a few times in some literature. It didn't catch on like NOAC did. SOAC was actually very trendy a couple of years ago. It was in a lot of the guidelines, a lot of studies. Uh, when I went to mid-year two years ago, it was on a lot of people's posters, but it still didn't stick like NOAC. However, now we have DOAC, our direct oral anticoagulant. So if that's going to be safer than NOAC, it's easy to say, like NOAC. So we'll stick with DOAC for the remainder of the presentation. When we think about anticoagulation, there are some guidelines that come to mind that are helpful resources. The Bible of anticoagulation is the CHEST guidelines, or AT9. That's the Anti-Thrombotic Therapy and Prevention of Thrombosis. We are on the ninth edition, hence the AT9. The problem with the CHEST guidelines is that they aren't published all that often. So you can see the most recent one was in 2012. It's very extensive. If you're looking for any anticoag-related issue, it's going to probably be in there. However, 2012 was pretty close to the approval of Pradaxa or Dabigatran. It had been on the market for about a year. Xarelto was not quite on the market, even though it was approved in 2011, so it must have been very close to that, because I remember reading it, and Xarelto was not um, on the market yet. So it doesn't really address the DOAC, so that's where our problem lies with chest guidelines for now. There was an update that was specific to venous thromboembolism treatment uh, in 2016, so that does have the DOACs in it. Uh, another guideline is the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association Task Force Guideline for the Management of AFib. So that can be helpful when we're talking about anticoagulation in patients who have atrial fibrillation. The other important guideline that I find very helpful is the Neurocritical Care Society Guideline. This is for reversal. It's specifically for reversal of intracranial hemorrhage. However, um, it's actually a good guideline for any life-threatening bleed because uh, even though Neurocritical Care Society cares the most about intracranial hemorrhage, those studies that we have, the literature we have available for the treatment of life-threatening bleeding is not just intracranial hemorrhage. These are small studies, these are case reports, and they're any sort of life-threatening bleeds. Your exsanguinating GI bleeds, your hypotensive traumas, 
they're all included in that literature that's reviewed by the Neurocritical Care Society because it would be impossible to just look at intracranial hemorrhage. The studies are all small enough, um, so they'd be even smaller if we, if we remove those other life-threatening bleeds. And if you're interested in looking at the data that we do have available, they do an excellent job of reviewing everything. And they don't just look at the reversal of oral anticoagulants, they also look at the reversal of the IV agents as well. And that was from 2016. It was online 2015 and then out in January of 2016. So what are we talking about when we talk about DOAX? Um, our vitamin K antagonist, of course, is warfarin. And then our DOAX are in two different classes. The first to market, of course, was our 2A inhibitor, 2A being thrombin, so our direct thrombin inhibitor, which is dabigatran or pradaxa. Again, that was 2011. It came to market. Then came the factor 10A inhibitors. Those are in order of approval. Rivaroxaban came about a year or two after dabigatran in 2011. Apixaban came in 2012. And adoxaban came a little later in 2014. That was all for non-valvural AFib, but they then later on got approval for the use in uh, VTE as well, or venous thromboembolism uh, later on. Adoxaban actually got VTE first, and then um, non-valvular AFib, but it's the newest kid on the block, and not very many people use it. It hasn't really caught on yet. Here we have uh, the clotting cascade. I like this diagram. I use this when I talk to my patients about switching to one of the agents or why warfarin doesn't have as predictable pharmacokinetics as the DOAC agents. Because you can see warfarin um, is the W's here. It acts on the vitamin K dependent clotting factors, two, seven, nine, and 10. So all throughout the clotting cascade. Whereas our newer agents, the direct oral anticoagulants, uh, are specific. So apixaban, rivoxaban, and adoxaban are right here at 10A, and dabigatran right on thrombin at the end of the clotting cascade there. So this is why vitamin K intake has such an effect on warfarin, because these vitamin K clotting dependent um, factors, if you're eating a lot of vitamin K, you're making more of those. Um, so that's where that issue comes into play. So what are the differences between the two um, that we know? So, of course, our warfarin requires routine monitoring. The DOACs have that predictable pharmacokinetics. That has to do with where they fall in the clotting cascade, but it also has to do with the fact that um, warfarin requires tailored dosing. Um, people have different genetic makeups that metabolize warfarin differently, um, slow metabolizers and rapid metabolizers. So, that becomes a, an issue. So the DOACs do have a predictable pharmacokinetic profile. Vitamin K antagonists have a lot of drug interactions. DOACs also have some drug interactions. Uh, warfarin has more, however, we can usually deal with that. We can, you know, increase monitoring, change the dose. Um, if the DOAC interacts with medication a lot of times, we can't use that. Warfarin, of course, has uh, lots of food interactions, whereas DOACs really don't. They both carry a risk of bleeding, which is obvious to us, but when I talk to my patients, it's not always obvious. If we're trying to change them to uh, a, a DOAC, a lot of times they have seen the advertisements on TV about all the big lawsuits for uh, Pridaxa and Xarelto. The fact of the matter is warfarin carries a risk of bleeding, probably a higher risk of bleeding. It could be debatable, but uh, probably worse bleeding with warfarin from what we've seen from the pivotal trials, and then also what I'll show you when we look at the claims data or real-world data. So uh, I do throw that in there, even though it's obvious, it's not always obvious to patients. For some reason, they have that comfort in warfarin and thinking that they're not going to bleed, but they're both blood, blood thinners or anticoagulants, and they both carry that risk of bleeding. So here we'll talk about the nuanced differences, as I mentioned, that could help aid us in picking an agent for a particular patient. We have once daily versus twice daily dosing. Rivaroxaban and adoxaban are dosed once a day. The rivaroxaban is debatable for me. <laughs> we can talk about that a little later. It really should be a twice a day drug in my opinion. And when we get into the claims data, um, I can kind of explain why I think uh, it shows what it shows. Um, but those are our once daily dosing medications, rivaroxaban and adoxaban. And if we do have a non-compliant patient or if compliance is an issue, uh, we do you know, tend to prefer something that can be given once a day. Twice a day, then, is our dabigatran in our pixaban. Food, 
administration with food doesn't matter for anything except for river roxaban. River roxaban does need to be given with a fairly large meal at the 15 and 20 milligram dose. The 10 milligram dose doesn't, that's not, you know, we're not talking about the disease states in this lecture that that would relate for, but that's prophylaxis and, um, you know, orthopedic surgeries. Um, but 15 and 20 you do have to administer with food. To make a trend, you're probably going to want to counsel your patient to take it with food up front, even though you don't have to, um, to avoid the risk of dyspepsia. It is very common with Pradapsa or Dabigatran, so we might as well, you know, recommend they take it with food, you know, in the first place, and maybe we can prevent getting that dyspepsia. The other nuanced difference between them has to do with their renal elimination. Um, here we have a chart of percent re percentage renal clearance. As you can see, Dabigatran is extensively renally eliminated at 80%, um, with Apixaban being the least renally eliminated at 27%. So this is definitely going to come into play. Um, you know, a lot of our patients with atrial fibrillation <coughs> have uh, some sort of renal impairment. So this is a, a good sort of chart to remember as far as um, the percentage of re renal elimination. Down here, we have the dosage adjustments. They do all have uh, recommended dosage adjustments in renal dysfunction. Apixaban is a little different. You have to remember your ABCs. A being age, greater than 80. B being body weight, less than 60. C being serum creatinine, greater than or equal to 1.5. You have to have two of the ABCs to get the 2.5 milligram dose twice a day. Otherwise, you'd be on the five milligram twice a day. So it's a little different in that it doesn't have a creatinine clearance cut off. It has the, the ABCs instead. River Roxaban, uh, the suggestion is when your creatinine clearance is less than 50 to dose adjust it down. And it's contraindicated with creatinine clearance less than 15. Adoxaban is interesting. So Adoxaban actually has a black box warning to uh, you're not supposed to use it in patients with good renal function. So if your creatinine clearance is greater than or equal to 95, you're not supposed to use a doxaban. And that is because in the major pivotal trial, uh, the Hokusawi VTE, and then also the, they had the TIMI-48 trial that looked at their atrial fibrillation, the patients who had good creatinine clearance have events. They had more VTE events. So when I first read it, before it was FDA approved, I was like, where are they going to go with this? <laughs> you know, what? how are we going to deal with this issue, and that's how they dealt with it. It has a black box warning not to use it if your creatinine clearance is greater than 95. Um, and as you would guess, the patients who had worse renal function actually did better and had less events. I wasn't sure when uh, uh, this came, you know, the approval trial came out or the pivotal trial came out, um, where this would fall into our repertoire or why we use it. It makes me a little nervous, especially since we don't have a test to um, check the coagulation in these patients. So we don't have like an INR to warfarin for these agents. So it's interesting, they, the, if you had great renal function, you did poorly. If you had bad renal function, you did well. Where in the continuum are the remainder of the patients? Um, but that is important to know if you have really good renal function, stay away from edoxaban. Uh, it does have a dosage decrease recommendation in the creatinine clearance of 15 to 50 range. You go to the 30 milligram daily, and it's not recommended in less than 15. Bigotran, sometimes I feel bad for, because it came to the market first, so it has a number of issues um, that got to be addressed for the other medications later on. Um, but it has a dosage decrease recommendation at a creatinine clearance less than 30. However, there were no patients included in the major pivotal trials with creatinine clearance less than 30, and that dose is, com the 75 choice daily is completely based on pharmacokinetic. It is, has never been tested for safety or efficacy. Um, so, CHESS, the American College of um, Cardiology CHESS physicians, would prefer everyone to consider it contraindicated with creatinine clearance less than 30 and forget that that 75 twice a day even exists. Um, European labeling does. They don't, they don't use it with creatinine clearance less than 30. Um, so we should probably be veering away from it with renal dysfunction. Honestly, as we're approaching a creatinine clearance of 50, we really should be thinking of other agents because we have other agents to use um, that might be safer in these patients. With a renal elimination of 80%, we should probably, um, as creatinine clearance is approaching 50, be thinking of some other agent. And certainly not using it in creatinine clearance less than 30, despite the fact that the FDA has approved it. So the other nuanced difference is that um, both dabigatran 
enidoxaban require parenteral anticoagulation for five to 10 days in VTE. So if somebody comes in and they have a VTE, the venous thromboembolism, um, you cannot just start using dabigatran in the doxaban. You would have to start them on Lovenox or another uh, low molecular weight heparin or heparin for five to 10 days before initiating the medication. If somebody uh, comes in with a VTE, you can start at Pixaban and Rivaroxaban. Uh, as we probably know, the dosing for a Pixaban and Rivaroxaban for the initial treatment of VTE is, is different than our normal dosing, and that is a Pixaban is double the dose, so 10 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Rivaroxaban is 15 milligrams twice a day for 21 days. That's how it was studied. That's why you can do it that way. The big chain of Duboxaban did not come up with a, a you know, dosage increase to study. They just flat out studied it after five to 10 days of the low weight heparin at their standard dosing. Um, so it's really just how they were studied. But it is an issue. A lot of times patients are gonna prefer not to do an injectable for five to 10 days, unless maybe that's what their insurance for, and then that might be a different story. You can talk them into it, but obviously we would prefer to do the apixaban or the river rock scan if we could to avoid that. So I won't get into each of the approval trials. We could talk about each one for an hour. Um, this is sort of what I'm safe, uh, I feel safe saying regarding all of those studies. And I think anyone who had ever been to a journal club <laughs> I think our students and our residents um, throughout the years have done each of those approval trials, and you probably wouldn't think that this is what I would say, because each one definitely had issues, um, and, I, and I would argue all of those issues. However, um, they did show similar safety and efficacy compared to Warfarin. I will say that. And they also uh, <laughs> had uh, non-inferiority for the treatment, all of the things that they're approved for, so stroke, and systemic embolism and AFib and treatment of VTE as well as prevention of VTE. And I will even go as far as say that they did have less intracerebral critical organ and life-threatening hemorrhage compared to work and they did have more GI bleed. And like I said, each one of those studies had its own issues. Each one was a little bit different, um, but I am safe saying this. Now the exciting part, <laughs> for me anyway. So the post-approval are our real-world data. Now, these, these claims data studies uh, are not randomized control studies. You know, that's what we always want. We want randomized controlled intention to treat, you know, placebo. Um, however, sometimes I think these are a little more telling because these are our prescribers who are out there prescribing these medications to the patients that they think are appropriate. There's no follow-up phone call or protocol that we're following. This is the, the real world data. Um, and I know it's highly statistically driven and it depends on how well things were coded, um, but I think this information tends to be useful for us in the real world. So there's several of them that we're gonna talk about. The first one is very similar to um, the pivotal trials in that it looks at these agents compared to warfarin. So our, our, our thoughts should be, if the randomized control trial is good, then this should look similar, and it does look similar, actually. <laughs> so the first one was the effectiveness and safety of dabigatran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban versus warfarin in non-valvular AFib. Edoxaban is not included in these studies because it is newer and it's been slower to pick up. It's from um, a Japanese drug company. I, you know, it would be interesting to see it could you know, be much more popular. If we were in Japan, it might be a different story. You know, it might be prescribed a lot more often, but certainly here in the U.S., it's been a slower pickup. Even with, um, they had a thing going when it first came to market where everyone could get it for $4, no matter what, for a whole year, um, trying to increase the number of people using it, but it, it hasn't really picked up. So it's not included in here. I'd like it to be because I really want there to be an agent once a day that's not Xarelto. But then again, they have their renal issues as well, but they, you know, contraindicated with the great renal function. So um, that'll be later on. We'll come back and talk about it when we have that real world data. But this first study looked at a large UA, uh, US insurance database. They were privately insured as well as Medicare um, patients. It was from October 1st of 2010 through June of 2015. 
there were three groups. They did propensity scoring to make sure, um, you know, to control for differences. <coughs> Had a Pixaban versus Warfarin, the Bigatran versus Warfarin, and River Roxaban versus Warfarin. And you can see those numbers there. A Pixaban um, is going to be less because it hadn't been on the market as long as the other two at the time. Um, Dabigatran is less than River Roxabian because when Dabigatran first came to market, uh, people jumped right on it and there was a ton of adverse events and that was probably because it was being used in inappropriate patients. Um, when River Roxabian came to market, uh, it caught on very quickly and a lot of people started using it. So that probably explains um, the fact that River Roxabian uh, outdid the Dabigatran even though it hadn't been around as long. So what did they find? They found that uh, a Pixaban versus Warfarin, there was a lower risk of an event. So that is sort of similar to the trials. They were non-inferior, so that's interesting. Um, Dabigatran versus Warfarin and River Roxaban versus Warfarin were similar risks, so that's just like the approval trials. So this is making me more confident in saying that they're probably as good as Warfarin, like my past slide said, that like sort of supports it. For bleeding, actually, a Pixaban and a Bigatran there was a lower risk of bleeding. Now this was surprising to me, the dabigatran, uh, and I think, I can only postulate why this is the case, but like I mentioned, when it first came to market, a lot of people jumped right on it. They were super excited to have an agent that we didn't need to monitor, and they were probably using it in inappropriate patients, and maybe not even the fault of their own, because we do have that recommended 75 bucks a day, and we can use it in patients with creatinine clearance 30 or more. And I think that probably a lot of people were prescribed it, they were inappropriate, and we had some major bleeds, and then people kind of um, learned what the issue was, and that it's 80% really eliminated, and that we probably should only be using it um, for patients who have better renal function. Um, so I'm thinking dabigatran, when used appropriately, actually does have a lower risk of bleeding than warfarin. Rivaroxaban was about the same, which looks like the clinical studies, the randomized pivotal you know, clinical approval trials. The next study looked specifically at dabigatran or rivaroxaban uh, in non-valular AFib for stroke bleeding and mortality risk. Again, it was a large data claims um, database for free for service Medicare patients that had non valvular AFib. And you can see these are really large numbers. That's the other thing that's great about claims data. You can get a lot of, you can look at a lot of patients. Um, and as long as you were coded correctly, it should be good information. This was from 2011 to 2014. It looked at adjusted hazard ratios um, for thromboembolic stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, uh, major extracranial bleeding, so anything other than an intracranial hemorrhage, and mortality. And what did we find? Well, river roxabian versus dabigatran, there was, for thromboembolic stroke, there was a reduction, but it wasn't significant. For intracranial hemorrhage, however, river roxabian had a statistically significant higher risk of intracranial hemorrhage, as well as major extracranial bleeding. And for GI bleeding as well, there was a statistically significant increase um, with river roxabian patients as opposed to the dabigatran patients. Um, mortality was statistically non-significant between the two groups until you pulled out those that were over the age of 75 with a CHADS 2 of over 2. Uh, and then, then river roxabian was actually associated with a statistically significant increase in mortality. So we'll keep that in the back of our head as we look at the remainder of the studies. So it's looking like dabigatran is doing better than river roxabian. The next study was a, a comparison of major bleeding risk among patients with non-valvular AFib. They were on any of the three agents, Epixaban, Dabigatran, Rivaroxaban, or Warfarin. Again, non-valvular AFib patients, this was 2012 to 2014, 45,000 patients. Uh, these were new prescription or newly anticoagulated patients. You can see the numbers there. This um, shows that Rivaroxaban, even in 2014, had out you know, prescriptions for river roxaban were beginning to outnumber warfarin, um, you know, for new starts. Uh, there was another uh, study that just came out that was like a, a data claim study that showed that that we are now, we've way surpassed warfarin. DOACs are certainly, most new starts are, are a DOAC agent. So what did we find? Well, versus mash warfarin, Apixaban had a, a significantly lower risk of major bleeding, as well as dabigatran. Rivaroxaban was about the same, so this is compared to warfarin, and this is exactly what that first one said, really, for the most part, except for that dabigatran had the lower risk 
as well as Apixaban, and Apixaban had the lower risk in both. Rivaroxaban was the same compared to Warfarin again. But when they looked at the DOAX comparing them to each other, what they found was Rivaroxaban versus Apixaban, Rivaroxaban had a higher risk of major bleeding. When they looked at the Apixaban, Dabigatran, Dabigatran, Rivaroxaban cohorts, there was no difference. So uh, Rivaroxaban, Apixaban seems to be doing winning out um, for major bleeding uh, versus warfarin and now also versus the other DOAX. And River, Rivaroxaban did worse than Dabigatran again, and there was a higher risk of GI bleeding. Apixaban did better than Dabigatran, less risk. And Apixaban versus Rivaroxaban, lower risk. So again, Rivaroxaban, highest risk of bleeding, and Apixaban, lowest risk of bleeding. So what can we take from all of this? It's certainly, like I said, they're not randomized control trials, and there's issues, and we can debate all those issues. Um, but, but we don't really have anything else to go by, and we're not going to have head-to-head -head trials of these agents. Uh, when all of the approval trials came out, um, many statisticians tried to do meta-analyses of all the results and compare them and see which did better and which didn't. We can't take anything from that because uh, the studies were all so different. So this is really where we can get our information from are these claims data or real-world studies, despite the fact that they do have some issues. So to summarize this section, the DOEX are fairly similar in preventing um, events. We don't have those head-to-head -head trials, so we do have to take into consideration our nuanced differences when we're trying to decide which agent, so renal impairment or histories of GI bleed. Um, and it might be that Apixaban is more efficacious. It's harder for me to say that because it only showed it in one study, but um, likely has a more favorable side effect profile compared to the other agents. So now, if we have any questions about that, you can write them down because we're going to totally switch gears now and go to uh, periprocedural management. So when we're talking about periprocedural management and DOAX, it's much different than with warfarin because um, the offset and onset is so different. So warfarin has a half-life of about 20 to 60 hours. So you have to hold it for quite a while before a procedure to have it completely out of your system. Uh, the DOAX have half, uh, half lives around 12 hours, and it really depends on the agent and the renal function, and, and in some instances, for some of the agents, uh, and to a lesser extent, hepatic um, impairment. The onset of warfarin also, the half life is very long, and the onset is several days, whereas with the, the DOAX, you give the DOAC, and right away you're pretty much going to be anticoagulated. So here's the, how long it would take. With the bigger train, you're fully anticoagulated within an hour, and the rest within you know two to four hours, one to two hours for adoxian. So we have to kind of keep that in mind and remember that because it's so much different than with warfarin. So in the past, you know, we always with warfarin, you'd have to start it right away. You start it. You know, you'd have your procedure and you start that night or the next day. You definitely don't want to do that with the DOAX. You have to make sure that hemostasis has been achieved because you're going to be fully anticoagulated very quickly. So warfarin, chest guidelines, recommends holding it for five days prior to a procedure. And like I said, you start it right away that night or the next morning, depending if they're evening takers or morning takers of the medication. Uh, and in some instances, you're going to have to bridge these patients with a low molecular weight heparin you know, while we're waiting for that INR to become therapeutic again. DOACs really only need to be held from one to two days prior to a procedure, with the exception of dabigatran due to that, you know, extensive renal clearance. If we have any sort of renal impairment, that's going to be, uh, have to be more days. It's going to stick around longer. Uh, and then you don't restart them again until hemostasis is achieved, as I said. So when we talk about holding for a procedure, um, these questions come up a lot. It doesn't depend on the patient's risk of thromboembolism because we can deal with that and manage that if we need to. If the warfarin, we can do bridge therapy. What we really, the first question I always ask is, well, what's the bleeding risk? What's the procedure? What's the chance that they're going to bleed? Where's the bleeding going to be? Is it in a critical location? Can the bleeding be controlled? Is it a dental procedure where we can use some sort of pro-hemostatic agent on, you know, topically? So that's the first question is, um, what's the bleeding risk? So if it's a moderate to high bleeding risk, then we are going to want to interrupt the DOAC therapy. If it's minor or a low risk of bleeding, we might actually want to continue the DOAC and use some of those other strategies. 
When I talk about high bleeding risk surgical procedures, I'm talking about like joint replacement or cardiac surgeries, any sort of spinal injections. And that's when you would want to hold the DOEC for probably two days. If it's the bigger train and your creatinine clearance is less than 50, you're going to want to hold it for three to five days, actually. Um, moderate to moderate bleeding risk surgical procedures, that's where that one to two days comes in, or two to three half lives. There is um, recommendations in the package insert um, to guide people. They're not um, very specific. You do have to use your clinical judgment. Uh, we have like at least 24 hours for river box band and doxaban. A pixaban got a little more specific, um, 48 hours for a moderate to high risk or clinically significant bleeding. And then that 24 hours, if it was going to be a bleed that could be controlled or in a non-critical location or, or a small risk of bleeding. And then Dabigatran has the specific recommendations with the creatinine clearance greater than 50 or less than 50. So that just makes you think we shouldn't be using it when our creatinine clearance is less than 50 because obviously it's sticking around that long. We don't have a test, and this is going to come up later when we talk about bleeding. Um, everyone's so worried about a reversal agent, but, but really what we probably should be worried about is it, um, getting a lab test that we can use to see how anticoagulated these patients are. Um, because if, if we're having to wait three to five days in these Dabigatran patients um, with a creatinine clearance less than 50, they're probably more anticoagulated than our patients that have a, a, a good creatinine clearance. So it would be really wonderful if we had a test. Europe, in Europe they have a test for Dabigatran, um, but, but we do not yet. And like I said, that'll come back up when we talk about bleeding. So post repeatable management, that takes the bleeding risk into account and also the risk of thromboembolism we have to think about as well. Um, so we have to make sure hemostasis is achieved because the onset of action is so fast with these agents, um, but also be weighing that risk of thromboembolism as well. So like I said, warfarin pops into this section quickly um, so we can talk about bridge therapy. Um, bridge therapy is the use of a low molecular weight heparin um, while a patient is off of warfarin prior to a procedure or while we're trying to achieve a therapeutic INR after a procedure. So these are for our higher risk um, patients and we'll talk about a study here in a second um, that, that kind of helps us define who should be getting bridge therapy but, but not too clearly. Um, so the BRIDGE trial, which was out in 2016, um, looked in at the safety and efficacy of perioperative bridging with low molecular weight heparin in patients with atrial fibrillation. So these patients all stopped warfarin five days prior to the procedure, which is recommended. And what it found was that there was no benefit from using low molecular weight heparin versus placebo in reducing the risk of, of a clot. And there was a three-fold increase in major bleeding in the patients who actually received the low molecular weight heparin um, after the surgery. The problem with the study is certain groups of high-risk patients were either excluded from the study or they were really underrepresented. Um, and that was our patients who had higher CHADS2 scores, which would be the patients that um, I would typically recommend bridging, so ones that have had a stroke in the past. Uh, and also our mechanical heart valve patients that we already know have a higher risk of having a thromboembolic event. So really what the study did is it clarified for anybody who um, felt like they needed to bridge their lower risk AFib patients while they were off of warfarin. Um, however, since it didn't look at the patients with ch higher CHAD2 scores and mechanical heart valves, those patients we likely are still going to bridge because they are very high risk of having an event versus having a bleed. But it does tell us not to bridge those lower risk atrial fibrillation patients because they're probably going to end up um, more likely to end up with a bleeding adverse event than they are getting any benefit from using it. So now we're going to switch gears again and talk about um, vitamin K antagonists and DOAC bleeding management and reversal um, or what we know to be the case because as I mentioned when we talked about the neurocritical care guidelines we aren't going to have a ton of data for the DOAC agents. They're going to be small, even for warfarin, these are all going to be small studies. They're going to be case reports. Um, it's, they're all going to be open label. So we'll go over what we know, our best effort here. Warfarin is actually pretty well outlined. Um, it's, it's outlined in the chest guidelines, reversal is, as well as in that neurocritical care guideline pretty well. So we kind of know what to do with warfarin, which is why I think we feel more comfortable using warfarin. Um, in some of those claims data studies, uh, 
what they found before they did matching was that the patients that were on, the more patients on warfarin were the sicker ones, um, the older ones, because people feel more comfortable with warfarin because they feel like they can reverse it. We don't have a reversal agent for the 10A inhibitors, we do for the direct thrombin inhibitor. Um, but the fact of the matter is, warfarin is a, is a different drug. So when we're talking, when we're comparing, comparing um, reversal, we have to take into consideration what we talked about with procedural management, in that warfarin, has a, it sticks around. You know, we need to, to reverse it because it sticks around. Uh, if we're talking about the DOEX and we have a minor bleed or we have a procedure that can wait like eight hours, they're going to be out of your system with the exception of dobigatran and renal impairment, but they have a fast onset and a fast offset, so uh, we don't really have to worry too much about the reversal unless it is a life-threatening bleed, and we will talk about that. Uh, with warfarin, we don't have a reversal agent. Everyone says we have vitamin K. It's not really a reversal agent. We give vitamin K to replete our vitamin K clotting, dependent clotting factors. Um, vitamin K actually is very slow to work. It's really not our reversal agent for warfarin. Our reversal agent for warfarin is um, Cassandra, our four-factor PCC, which does work very quickly. Um, so these are what we have available for each of the, the agents, and we'll, we'll get into all of this later, but I'm going to switch over to the next warfarin slide. So the American College of Chest Physicians does recommend uh, rapid reversal with Cassandra, four-factor PCC. You do give vitamin K. That is to maintain the reversal and replete the factors, but reversal is done with four-factor PCC. And then you give the vitamin K by IV injection, 10 milligrams. So this is why. Um, as I mentioned, PCC, 15 minutes from the end of the infusion um, to time of reversal. The onset is 15 minutes, it lasts about 24 hours. Vitamin K, time for reversal is anywhere from six to 24 hours. Onset, anywhere from four to 12 hours. The duration of action tends to be an issue as well because these patients are on an anticoagulant for a reason, and once we have the bleed controlled, they probably need to be anticoagulated again. And if we've given them a lot of vitamin K, it's going to take a while to get them anticoagulated again. So it does have its issues. But as you can see, this is just to replete clotting factors. Our reversal really is the PCC or the Cassandra for immediate reversal. Uh, we'll talk about the comparison between the PCC and the FFP, which is how Cassandra got approved. Cassandra is uh, relatively new. Um, so the approval trial was versus FFP. But you can see FFP or fresh frozen plasma takes much longer to reverse as well. So you can see why we have we use the PCC and the vitamin K and FFP as well to maintain the reversal. So four-factor PCC, the issues, um, the characteristics are, are there for each. Um, PCC does have variability in composition. It might be thrombogenic or it is thrombogenic, so we have to be careful about redosing. A lot of times we reverse and then we maintain a reversal with uh, FFP and the vitamin K. You have to be careful then for DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. It is expensive and it does contain heparin, so you have to be careful in anyone who has a history of HIT. Um, fresh frozen plasma does have some issues as well. Large volume, long infusions and thaw times doesn't work that quickly. It can cause some transfusion related lung injuries. It does contain Van Gulliban factor. Uh, here it kind of shows why the Cassandra works so much faster as far as what factors it contains and how many units per ml. And you can, you can see why it would take a whole lot more FFP versus the Cassandra uh, to, to reverse the agent, to reverse warfarin. So this was the study that they used um, to approve uh, Cassandra, and it was versus FFP. And you can see there the results. Um, you did get effective hemostasis eventually from the FFP, um, but as far as rapid reversal, uh, the Cassandra is, is much faster. Um, frequency of ser uh, serious adverse events and thromboembolism were similar between the groups, uh, but there was a higher rate of fluid overload in the FFP group, which makes sense because we have to a lot of it, and these are high volumes. So in summary, the management of warfarin like I said, we feel more comfortable with it. It's well outlined. Most institutions have a protocol. Uh, when someone comes in with a, a warfarin, who's on warfarin, who's having a bleed, we can get a stat INR. We know where we are. We, you know, we know what 
All right, we have an elevated INR. Our INR is therapeutic. We have a, a something to look at to to begin our process. Um, so they come in, they're bleeding, they have a life-threatening bleed. We administer the four-factor PCC, and then we can check INRs. We can continue to check INRs until you know we're less than 1.4 an INR, um, and we feel comfortable with that because we know the agent is gone. That's the problem with the DOEX. We don't have that. We don't have that comfort in knowing where we're at. You know, we it could still be in the system, um, and we don't know that we're fighting against an anticoagulant or not. Or, or we're continuing to bleed. Is it because we have the added um, effect of the anticoagulant, or is the anticoagulant gone? Whereas with warfarin, we kind of know when it's gone, when that effect is gone. So DOAC reversal is a little more muddy, um, a little bit more like alphabet soup as far as what we're supposed to do, with the exception of dabigatran, which does now have its own reversal agent on the market. So what do we do? If someone comes in and they have a, a severe bleed and they're on a DOAC, you need to figure out what the agent was and when the last time they took it was because that's going to make a difference, as well as renal and hepatic dysfunction of how long it's going to stick around. And then the interval since the last dose, because it does take that five half lives that we talked about in periprocedural management to completely eliminate the drug from the system. And this is just the, the renal elimination again, because that will come into play um, when these patients come in and we're trying to decide what to do or how long we're going to be having that anticoagulant effect playing against us as we're trying to stop this bleeding. Uh, Adoxamine, rivaroxaban, and apixaban, so the 10A inhibitors, do also have a risk of bioaccumulation and hepatic failure. So these patients come in, we don't have a test to check like an INR, but we can get a stat serum creatinine and we can get uh, LFTs and we can see what we're going to be dealing with, get an idea of, of how long these anticoagulants are going to stick around. As far as coagulation testing goes, we can order it. Um, however, prolonged coagulation tests um, can indicate a prolonged effect of the agent, but if you get a normal result, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the DOAC um, effect has resolved because they're not specific for these agents. You can check a PTINR, an APTT, a TT, or an ECT. Um, ECTs are really a uh, more research test. Thrombin clotting time, or direct thrombin clotting time, is pretty good test for dabigatran, um, but it's not as commonly used here. Uh, it is used more frequently in Europe, and they actually have a, a point of care testing device that does a DTT. Here's a chart that kind of tells you what each test can show us. Um, some of them are going to show us nothing. So for, for prothrombin time and dabigatran, it's completely insensitive, same as INR. It's not going to show us anything. Um, an APTT is qualitative for dabigatran, and an, an ECT is quantitative, which is what we want. So an ECT is, is going to give us a little more information. Um, for rivaroxaban, it will affect the PT. For uh, anti-10A levels, it needs to be calibrated your lab test would have to be calibrated for those agents, and most of the time they're just calibrated for our low molecular weight heparin. So it's probably not going to tell us much. Um, but we can order it just in case. You know, if, if they are off, it probably means the drug is still in there, but if it's within normal limits, um, it's not really telling us that the anticoagulation effects have resolved. So in my opinion, um, I think of before reversal agents, what we really need is a test to check the level of anticoagulation in these patients. But what we do is the same thing that we would do for anyone that came in with a bleed. We would, you know, resuscitation matters, uh, red blood cell transfusions, try to maintain the renal function, find out where the bleeding source is, do surgical intervention if needed. They do have short half-lives. We're not going to have to deal with them for as long as we would if it was warfarin. Um, in some instances, you can give activated charcoal. You can try it for any of the agents. However, river roxaban would have had to have been just taken so rapidly absorbed from the GI tract that it wouldn't really do much for river boxing. To make a train, it might be helpful to give activated charcoal if the drug had been given within a few hours. Hemodialysis works for dubigatran. It doesn't work for the other agents. Um, PCC should be given for activated PCC. There is some data um, that shows that these do correct some of the coagulation tests, which are not that great, but if we've corrected them, um, you know, some level of our anticoagulation is gone, but we don't know for sure. So we don't have a good way of knowing if they're working that well, but they should be given if somebody comes in with a life-threatening bleed that's on a DOAC agent. And uh, for Pradaxa, 
we would give IDRS a zoom out, which is a reversal agent, and we'll talk about that first, and then the PCC if necessary. Recombinant factor 7A and uh, uh, versus the PCC actually had higher risk of thrombosis. So in the neurocritical care guidelines, they recommend avoiding the recombinant factor 7A and sticking with the PCC or the activated PCC. And that's prothrombin complex concentrate. Cassandra is a four-factor PCC. So specifically, the dobigatran reversal agent um, IDRS is Zumab or Praxabine um, has been approved. It is a specific reversal agent for Pradaxa. It's a monoclonal antibody. It has an dobigatran has an affinity for IDRS is Zumab that's 350 times its affinity for thrombin. So it sucks that right up when it's administered. So it binds to free and thrombin bound <coughs> dobigatran. It actually pulls dobigatran off of thrombin that it's already bound to. It hasn't shown any evidence of a prothrombotic event. Eventually, that complex is renally eliminated. It has a rapid onset and a dose-dependent effect that's sustained for about 24 hours from what the studies show. And we'll talk about, I shouldn't say studies, the study, which was uh, an interim analysis, actually, that was used to approve it. So it didn't even complete the study before the FDA approved it, um, which is still ongoing. So it's sustained for over 24 hours with a, over a two-gram dose. Uh, in that study, they did use APTT, TT, and ECT, and all were normalized. ECT is a very common trial test in these bleeding studies. And as I mentioned, DTT is re or the TT is regularly available um, in European countries to check the level of the bigger trans anticoagulation. So the approval study for IDRS is UMAP was reverse AD. It was an interim phase two analysis. Like I said, they were very, the FDA was very excited and let them approve it. Uh, before the study was even completed. So it looked at um, anticoagulation reversal capacity and safety in patients who had serious bleeding or who needed uh, an urgent surgery. So there were two groups, those that came in with bleeding and those that needed to have surgery right away. They were given two doses of 2.5 grams, given 15 minutes apart. That 15 minutes was to draw those tests, the ECT, the DTT, um, but in the on the package insert and in real, you know, now, now that it's approved, we give them right away 2.5 doses right one after another. Um, the patients in the study were primarily elderly. The average age was 76.5. Um, most of them had atrial fibrillation and creatinine clearances greater than 30. And two thirds had creatinine clearance greater than 50. I'm actually glad that they did because that shows that we're using the big train appropriately. Um, because these are the patients that should be probably used in, um, not the patients with with poor renal function. So that showed that you know prescribing might be going well. There were five thrombotic events secondary to not restarting anticoagulation. So it wasn't deemed that it was due to the agent, the reversal agent. It was because the anticoagulation was not restarted afterward. There were 18 deaths. That was either from the index event, so what they came in major bleeding for, or the surgery that they had, or some other underlying condition. And then they did use those DTT and ECT at 10 and 30 minutes, and then 2, 4, 12, and 24 hours after the second infusion. And primary endpoint was measured at four hours. So not clinical endpoints, but um, they did actually have a subgroup where they the provider could say when they thought the patient stopped bleeding. We can talk about that in a second. So here's the groups, group A and group B, and the number of patients. So we're not talking about a lot of patients. They set to look at 500 patients, but like I said, the FDA let them um, go for approval at the interim analysis. So a small number of patients. There's the different groups and the age, their creatinine clearance, um, the median time since their last dose, which honestly, in most of those cases, it should have been fairly out of their system anyway. Um, and then if they had an elevated DTT at baseline or an elevated C, um, ECT at baseline. So actually, these are kind of, we would expect them to be a little bit higher if they were fully anticoagulated. However, the primary endpoint, again, was median maximum reversal within four hours, and it was 100% for both DTT and ECT. Uh, DTT normalized in 98 and 93% of, of group A and B patients, respectively, and ECT normalized in 89 and 88% of group A and B patients, respectively. Here's a secondary endpoint where the provider or the investigator um, 
decided when the patient actually stopped bleeding. Uh, and it, in 38 patients, it was within 11 hours. And, and group B for the surgery patients, uh, it was performed surgery was performed in 36 of the 39, so they felt like it was reversed enough that they could do the surgery in the majority of patients. And interoperatively, the surgeons said in 33 of the cases, they felt like the patient didn't have any anticoagulation on board, so it was effective. Two felt like it was mildly abnormal, and one seemed like they might still be anticoagulated. But this is all just from investigator, the, the surgeon, you know, making that assessment during the surgery have issues. So in sum summary, uh, in these this cohort of patients that had these multiple comorbidities who were taking dubigatran in either a life-threatening emergency, uh, the 5-gram dose of the IDRAS Zumab did result in an immediate and complete reversal of dubigatran in 88 to 98% of the patients. Um, in the meantime, to cessation of bleeding was less than 12 hours. And uh, the clinician judge interoperative hemostasis was normal in 92% of those who could be evaluated in group B. Uh, there were no safety concerns that were identified. So now we have this reversal agent for dubigatran. I don't like the word antidote because the antidote would mean it stops bleeding. It doesn't stop bleeding, it reverses dubigatran. So now we have an agent that can pull dubigatran out of the system so we can deal with whatever's causing the bleeding and hopefully um, regain hemostasis. So for factor 10A inhibitors, um, the reversal agent is not approved yet. There's actually two that are undergoing investigation. One of them keeps getting so close, which is interesting that they approved Praxivine on just an interim analysis, but for Indexin at Alpha, they keep sending it back. They want more data. So it could be that it is for more agents, and some of the issues that they've been having, we can talk about it, is because they wanted more information. If they're gonna include in their labeling that, they're gonna, that they can reverse all of the 10A inhibitors, as well as um, Lovenox, they're putting in their package insert, then they wanted more information. But it is a specific reversal agent for direct and indirect factor 10A inhibitors, and it acts through antithrombin. It's also a, it's a modified human, human recombinant factor 10A decoy protein. In November 2013, it did get FDA breakthrough therapy designation, but then it was denied approval in August. Um, that's because they did want that extra information. They wanted more information for Lobanox, and they wanted more information for Adoxidan as well. So in summary, then, so I won't talk any more about a DEX now, but there is a, you know, the, the trial has been published, there have been trials published, but since it's not approved, we won't talk about it yet, but it is coming soon. So in summary, there are a number of assays that are responsive to 10A inhibitors. There's no single test that can accurately measure the anticoagulation status of a patient, which I think is the biggest issue with these medications. Um, and there's no test to accurately predict what our bleeding risk could be. And until the factor 10A specific reversal agent becomes available, we would manage these patients on 10A inhibitors um, by discontinuing the drug, supportive measures, and then giving the, the PCC, because we don't have it. It's not well outlined. The bigger train we can give the idoracizumab, or we can give the four factor PCC. The 10A inhibitors, we're probably gonna give the, we're gonna give the PCC. There is some data that shades say that it works, but we don't yet have a reversal agent for this medication. Here's just a summary. So warfarin, um, vitamin K, four-factor PCC, given right around the same time, because that, that vitamin K, even though it works slowly, um, will maintain the reversal from the four-factor PCC. FFP will also maintain the reversal. For the 10A inhibitors, we're gonna give the PCC, APCC, so some sort of, um, you know, we're gonna replete the clotting factors. And Dexana Alpha, when it's approved, we can try the activated charcoal, um, for these patients. The neurocritical guidelines um, for the reversal do go into details about who you might want to consider that in because it is an aspiration risk giving activated charcoal. So maybe in an, an intubated patient or in a patient that you know is not going to um, choke on it if you give it to it. So it's really the, the use of activated charcoal is probably very limited. And for the direct thrombin inhibitors, we're going to give the idoracizumab. We can consider dialysis also, because dubigatran can be dialyzed off as the other agents cannot. Consider activated charcoal in specific patients, and if necessary, we can give PCC or APCC um, if you know they continue to bleed after the idoracizumab. Does anyone have any questions? That was a lot of information. I'll hodgepodge do. So, any questions? <laughs> Concerns, issues, if anyone is interested in reading any of those, 
real world data, clean data studies, you can let me know. You can email me. Um, I do have them. Some of them are just accepted for publication and aren't edited into the journal yet. So I can 